Jesus complained of his thirst. Day 33 Our most tender Lord was so exhausted and dried up by the exceeding great bitterness of his pain and anguish and by his immoderate blood shedding that he cried out, I thirst. This is indeed a little word, but full of mysteries. First of all, it may be taken literally, for it is only natural that all who are about to breathe their last should have thirst and a desire to drink. But how great was the dryness felt by him who is the wellspring of living water, but who was now exhausted and dried up by the heat of his burning love when he could truly say, Like water I am poured out, and again, my strength is dried up like an earthen vessel. For not only did he shed all his own blood and pour forth whatever he had a moisture by his tears, but the very marrow of his bones and all his heart's blood were consumed for our sakes by the heat and flame of his love. Rightly then, he said, I thirst. Secondly, this word can be spiritually understood as if Christ said to all in general, I thirst for your salvation. Hence, St. Bernard said, I thirst, cried Christ, not I grief. O Lord, what do you thirst for? For your faith, your joy. I thirst because of the torments of your souls far more than for those of my body. Have pity, if not upon me, at least upon yourselves. And again, good Jesus, you wore the crown of thorns. You were silent about your cross and your wounds. Yet for thirst alone you cried out, I thirst. What then do you thirst for? Truly for the redemption of men alone and for the joy of the human race. This thirst of Christ was a hundredfold more sharp and vehement than his natural thirst. He had, moreover, another kind of thirst, that is to say, of suffering more, and proving to us still more expressly and clearly his measureless love, as if he said to men, See how I am exhausted and worn away for the sake of your salvation. See how horrible are the pains and torments that I suffer. The savage cruelty of men has brought me down near to nothing. The sinners of earth have drunk out all my blood, yet still I thirst. Not yet is my heart satisfied, not yet is my desire fulfilled. Not yet is the flame of my love quenched. For if it were possible for me, unpleasing to my Father, that I should be crucified again, even a thousand times for your salvation and conversion, or that I should hang here in all this misery and pain, even until the last judgment day, most gladly would I do it, both to prove to you the measureless love of my heart for you, and to soften your stony hearts, and to excite you to love me in return. This is why I hang here so thirsty by the fountain of your hearts, so that I may observe the devout souls that come near to draw out of the bottomless well of my passion. Therefore the maiden to whom I shall say, Give me a little water to drink out of the pitcher of your conscience, the water that is of devotion, compassion, of tears and mutual love, and who shall let down her pitcher to me and shall answer, Drink, my Lord, and for your camels, that is, your servants, who carry you about daily on their bodies, and who both by night and day 
art held fast bound in your yoke. I will draw in like manner the water of brotherly love. That is the maiden whom the Lord has prepared for the son of my Lord, even the bride of the word of God, united to my humanity. And she shall be worthy to enter like a bride with her bridegroom into the bed chamber of everlasting rest at the invitation of the bridegroom who said come my blessed bride possess the kingdom of my father for i was thirsty and you gave me to drink thirdly we may apply this word to the father as if christ had said to his father father I have made known your name unto men. I have finished the work you gave me to do, and in your work I have spent my whole body as your instrument. Behold, I am all exhausted and worn away. Nevertheless, I still thirst to do and to suffer more for your honor. This is why I hang here stretched out to the farthest breath of love, for I desire to be an everlasting sacrifice, a sweet odor unto you, an eternal praise, and at the same time, an everlasting atonement and salvation unto men. Thus too might this strong Samson have said, You, O Lord, have given into the hand of your servant this exceeding great salvation and victory, and yet behold, I die of thirst. As if he would say, My Father, I have fulfilled your gracious will. I have finished the work of man's salvation as you required it, yet still I thirst, for the sins whereby you are offended are infinite. Therefore I desire that the charity and merits of my passion, whereby you are to be appeased, may be also infinite. And as I now offer myself for the salvation of all men a peace offering and a living sacrifice, so through me may all men appease you by offering me to you as a peace offering to your eternal glory in memory of my passion and to supply for all their defects. How pleasing to the Father must have been this desire of love. For what else was this thirst but a certain sweet and delightful refreshment to the Father, both warm and healing, and at the same time the blessed renewal of mankind? Or what other language does this burning throat speak to us than that of Christ's burning love? out of which, indeed, measureless and without bounds, he wrought all his works. In truth, this is the most noble sacrifice of our redemption. This is that peace offering which will be offered even till the last day by all the good through the Holy Ghost to the Most High Father in memory of the Son to the everlasting glory of the adorable Trinity and the admirable prophet and fruit of salvation for mankind. Here clearly is the measureless treasure of our reconciliation, which upon earth never fails, for it is greater than all the debts of the world. This is that measureless love higher than the heavens, for it has restored again the ruin of the angels, deeper than hell, for it has free souls from there, wider and broader than earth, for it is without end and cannot be understood by any created understanding. Oh, how sharp and vehement was this thirst of our Lord! For not only did he then say once, I thirst, but even still without ceasing, he said within our hearts, I thirst, woman, give he to drink. So great, I say, and so mighty is that thirst, that he asked for drink, not only of the children of Israel, 
but even of the Samaritans, and to each one does he complain of his thirst. Next paragraph. But what do you thirst for, O good Jesus? My drink and my food, he answered, is that men should do my Father's will. Now this is the Father's will, even your sanctification and salvation, that you may sanctify your souls by walking in my precepts, by performing true works of penance, by adorning yourselves with all virtues, that as a bride made ready and adorned, you may be worthy to come to my supper in my Father's kingdom, and to sleep with me as my elect bride in the bed chamber of my Father's heart. Oh, with what longing does Christ desire to lead all men there? This is what he meant when he said, Wherever I shall be, there also shall my servant be. And again, Father, I will that even as we are one, they may be one. Oh, how beyond all understanding is this thirst of Christ! Oh, what sweat and labor he underwent three and thirty years for the sake of this! For this the marrow and blood of his very heart were spent. See what our tender Lord said to his Father, The zeal of your house has eaten me up. Truly, he would have allowed himself to be crucified even a thousand times, rather than suffer one soul to perish for any fault of his. Oh, how did this inward thirst afflict him when he thought that he had both done all that he could and even a hundredfold more than he needed to have done, and yet that so few had been turned to him and gained by him. His whole body was now worn away. All his blood was shed. There was nothing left which he could do, and therefore he was forced to confess and say, It is finished. Yet by all his labors and sorrows and pains, he had brought no greater fruit, no greater gain to his father than this. Truly, it was the bitterest of all sorrows that in so hard a fight his victory had not been more majestic and that he returned victorious to his father with so few spoils. Therefore, as many as refresh him not by fulfilling his will and earnestly performing whatever is pleasing and honorable to him, and by manfully and bravely resisting all that reason tell him, and by manfully and bravely resisting all that reason tell them is displeasing to him, all these will with the damned hear him one day say, I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Go, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Fourthly, there is another inward meaning of this word, namely, that Christ uttered it out of the love which inwardly drew him towards all men, thus declaring unto us his burning love and opening his own heart, as a delightful couch where we may feed pleasantly on and at the same time inviting us unto it saying I thirst for you for as the draught which we drink is sent down through the throat with sensible delight and goes down pleasantly into our inward parts and passes into the substance and nature of our body even so Christ out of the burning thirst of his love, takes spiritual delight in drinking in all men into himself, and thus receiving them as it were, and sweetly swallowing them, and incorporating them into himself, and bringing them into the secret chamber of his loving heart. 
Therefore he said, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all things to me. That is, as many as allow themselves to be drawn by me, and subject themselves unto me as obedient instruments, allowing me to do with them according to my gracious will. But they who resist Christ, who allow not themselves to be licked up by the flame and heat of Christ's love, so that he may drink them in, and swallowed them down into the depth of his being, these indeed quench not his thirst, but give him a bitter draught instead, even the works of their own self-will. And these, as soon as our Lord tasted, he vomited out. 5. This word may be taken to express what our Lord said to his sorely afflicted mother as she stood by the cross. O oh, my sweet mother, see into what need the Son of God and your Son has been brought down. I indeed created the seas and the springs and all moisture. I command the clouds and they pour forth rain. To my angels I give to drink of the delights of heaven, and to my saints the cup of everlasting blessedness. To my friends still upon earth I give to drink of inward consolation, and to my disciples of divine wisdom, and to all sinners I give the chalice of redemption. Yet there is not one, no, not one who will refresh my tongue in this my bitter thirst. Oh, how that word must have cut and pierced into the devout and heavy heart of the spotless virgin when she heard her only begotten son, whom she had nursed on her virgin breast, complain of his thirst in his great need and yet could not help him. Perhaps she answered him this, O oh, my sweet son, I am seized with such exceeding and intolerable anguish that I cannot help you. I am so crucified with you by unutterable compassion that I cannot move. I am now without any strength at all because I see you, the only comfort of my heart. Crucified so unjustly before my eyes, so shamefully despised, so cruelly slain. And yet I cannot die with you, nor bring you any help. I am wholly melted away. The marrow of my soul is melted. You see, O oh my loving son, that I am all melted by the heat of your love, and like the grape, and pressed out by the grievous weight of your passion. Therefore draw me all into yourself, drink me and swallow me, change me into your body, that I may be wholly your refreshment and relief in your grievous thirst. Sixthly and lastly, we may gather from this word that Christ obtained great consolation to his loving mother and all the saints, and lightened the labor which they have borne for his sake, whether by action or by suffering. For even if their labor and affliction be small, yet is it altogether pleasing and delicious, like Christ, to take some sweet drink. For on the cross itself he drank in with great delight all the compassion, sorrow, devotion, sighs, and tears which were the fruit of meditation upon the Passion. And all the persecutions, distresses, afflictions born for his honor, all the rigorous penances, fast, prayers, watchings, all the mortifications of nature, all the works of obedience and charity, 
and all the deeds to be performed in His honor, even to the last judgment day. All these our Lord Jesus drank in, in a certain marvelous way, and swallowed them in His great thirst, and joined to His own body, and united with His own works, and cleansed in His warm blood, and heated in the fire of His divine love, and perfected and finished by His own merits and action, whatever was imperfect and defective, and so at last offered them in the sight of His Eternal Father, and made them pleasing and acceptable unto Him.